so it does, everyone doesn't have to respond. Great, terrific. <laughs> Okay, really sorry about the delay. We're having some issues. Um, as you'll see um, on the left there, it shows that the hosts are Asia and Emily. Um, however, that is incorrect. <laughs> uh, we had to use a different login for me to get audio today. So my name is Tamara Talansky. Um, welcome to Introduction to Digitization. Um, this is um, put on by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts and today I will be introducing you to some of the basics of digitization as well as discussing digital preservation and what you need to consider before you start any digitization project. Um, Diani Feige from, um, from CCAHA here, she's our Director of Preservation Services. She is with me today as well and she will be helping with any technical assistance and is available through the chat window if you have any inquiries. In addition, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please enter them in the questions window. Okay, so let's get started. Figuring out what to do first is overwhelming. In order to have a cohesive program, you will need a plan. So we're going to touch on a lot of subjects today, from what exactly is digitization, why it's important, how you can implement it at your institution. Um, we will also discuss hardware, software, formats, and long-term management. First of all, let's quickly define these two terms, which sometimes get used interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. Digitization, according to the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, also known as FAGI, digitization is the process of recording an analog signal in digital form, commonly for increased access or for preservation purposes. In other words, digitization is converting data or an image into something digital such as scanning or photographing. Digital preservation, on the other hand, according to the American Library Association, combines policies, strategies, and actions to ensure access to reformatted and born digital content regardless of the challenges of media failure and technological change. The goal is the accurate rendering of authenticated content over time. It's really important to understand the differences between them um, as one is a means to an end using the physical object along with hardware to produce the digital image, the actual digitization. The other is a long-term commitment, a way of ensuring long-lasting access through policy development and an institution's dedication to preserving the content into the future. It requires active management over time and a commitment from staff to keep policies updated. For the purpose of this webinar, we will predominantly be discussing digitization factors and planning, but next we're going to briefly touch on digital preservation policies. A well-defined digital preservation policy is essential in order for any institution to carry out its mission to preserve digital content. The goal is to cultivate a long-term repository for our digital materials and to be better serve the shared objective to preserve digital content. A policy will depict the need and methodologies for protecting the digital content. And these preservation accomplishments will guarantee that faculty, staff, researchers, students, visitors, and any additional users will have continuing access to the growing digital resources at the institution. The policy will lay out and define such things as the purpose, why you want to preserve your digital treasures, goals and objectives of your institution, any challenges your institution may face, such as identifying changes in media or equipment or costs associated with digital preservation or maintaining collaborative relationships, best practices for making the content available, stakeholders who will exactly will be involved, also defining the scope of your collection and content types. 
Not only is a good policy a great way to lay out methods for protecting and preserving collections, it's also a great tool to obtain funding for collections care, digital preservation, upkeep and management, and for inclusion in grant applications. When designing a digital imaging project, a plan is a must. Before you start any project, you'll need to ask yourself some basic questions. Why are you digitizing? Who is your audience? Who else needs to be involved? For instance, who are the key staff or collaborators outside of the institution? What should you digitize? In other words, how do you decide what criteria to use in order to select materials? Are you scanning for preservation purposes? How about copyright issues? What about hardware, software, best practices? Will it be in-house or will you outsource it? How will you manage and deliver these files? It's so important to ask your institution or yourself these questions before jumping into a digitization program. We'll be going over these today. So you've decided you want to digitize, but why? The use of technology has become a core part of any institution's mission. It's important to figure out exactly why you want to digitize and have a plan. There are several general reasons institutions or individuals may want to digitize their materials or collections. These are just a few of those reasons. Access or outreach to reach a broad range of users. Preservation to protect the original and reduce handling and storage needs, allowing you to free up space. I'm going to go into a few more specifics of each to explain their advantages. The primary and usually the most obvious advantage of digitization is that it enables greater access to collections of all types. All manner of material can be digitized and delivered in electronic form. Digital materials can be made available to a broader audience than those who have the resources or ability to travel to see the analog collections. People can simultaneously view or use the same document from multiple locations. Audiences can access the collections for often unanticipated and broad ranging research interests. For example, historical materials may be used for local history or genealogical research. Um, it's possible to search, browse, and compare materials in useful and creative ways. Patrons can browse through thumbnails of the materials in image catalogs, including images of materials that were previously inaccessible, such as glass plate negatives, oversized, or fragile materials. And digitization may also promote outreach to professors, research institutes, and scholarly communities, as well as sharing photos on social media platforms. Preservation is another very com motiv common motivation for digitizing. Developing a digital surrogate of a rare or fragile original object can provide access to users while preventing the original from damage by handling or display, since often the fragile condition of collections prevents their use. Digitization assists in keeping original materials secure as the originals will not need to be handled as often. Though digitization is not yet a preservation medium, it definitely has a preservation component. It's excellent for minimizing wear and tear on the original. It's preferred for paper-based materials, widely embraced by scholars over microfilm. Some drawbacks, though, media obsolescence concerns. Records may need to be reformatted and copied to new supported technologies that are more commonplace in the future. Eventually, we will progress by developing and refining different techniques for preserving different digital formats. Another concern, costs. You don't want to waste money by creating digital objects that can't be preserved. So create the best quality digital images possible. Ultimately, providing access to digital copies enables the user to reduce the use of fragile originals. In that sense, digitization is a kind of preservation. The third big advantage of digitization is storage. Many organizations still depend on paper-based record keeping, and there are a lot of challenges with that. A lack of storage space 
Collections may require a significant amount of space to store, and that only gets bigger as the amount of documents grow over time. Paper records need to be stored close at hand for quick access, which is not always practical. Materials may be prone to damage. Over time, paper quality does deteriorate. Natural disasters can happen. can happen anywhere, a flood, a storm, an earthquake. Document vulnerability. The loss of any critical document of value can cause a serious problem. Also, the possibility of a confidential document being accessed, accessed excuse me, by unwanted or unauthorized people who could tamper with it or steal it. And costs. There can be numerable costs, such as storing, shelving, retrieving and cataloging the materials, the cost of building libraries, the cost of power for heating, lighting, air conditioning, etc., all of which are direct costs to the institution or individual. Next, we'll talk about the audience and your workflow. So who exactly is your audience? Who will use the images and benefit from your digitization project? Some materials can and will be used by a variety of people, but they will use them differently. So narrowing the audience will help you make decisions. How do you identify your audience? Is it a cultural organization or a general user? Maybe it's students or researchers and scholars. It could be genealogists, business community, universities. A good goal is to make things available that both scholars and a broader audience will find interesting. Knowing your users will help you determine what materials you select, the software and resolution needs of the scans, what kind of equipment you need, which kind of hardware and software technical and metadata choices you will need to make. How will these digital reproductions of the object be used? Publications or school projects? Will they need to be printed out? Resources? Are they web-based or for a specific class? Deciding how the materials will be used will impact how you design and plan your digitization project. You also need to define roles and responsibilities of various staff and stakeholders, people who will be accountable or responsible for particular digital imaging or preservation strategies. In-house staff, building skills for them to be able to contribute to the project. Project staff, will you be hiring or reassigning staff? Technical support, you should become allies with your IT department. Are there partners outside of the organization? or your consortium or network? Are there area experts you want to reach out to? Volunteers, such as local historical groups, local experts, local genealogists. Collaborative efforts involving two or more organizations can sometimes help to draw grant funding. Are there any potential funders or users, any p patrons in particular? These are the individuals that are supportive of your digitization or digital preservation efforts and can help drive the process. Based on how much material you have and what preservation actions, actions you're taking, or in other words, based on what needs to be done, you will need staff to fill the following functions. Selection and research of materials, scanning, creating metadata, file management and backups, quality control, website design and technical support and project management. Sometimes digital imaging projects will involve staff beyond those specifically assigned to the project. Some additional skills you may need to consider are conservation treatment, photographic skills and techniques, database administration, and computer programming. It's also important when starting digital imaging initiatives to consider managerial issues. Among responsibilities that fall to project man managers are the following. Setting realistic timelines, objectives, and expectations for the project. Determining the best approach for accomplishing project goals. Developing and defending budgets. Facilitating communication among project participants, including outside vendors monitoring production, which includes quality and costs, 
and looking beyond the project's end. Next we will talk about the selection of materials and we will touch briefly on copyright. So how do you decide what to digitize? It's important to establish and define the criteria to help you prioritize what you will be digitizing. This list is just some of the criteria that can affect the selection of materials for digitization. This criteria should be used to evaluate which collections to consider first, depending on the degree of emphasis on access and preservation goals, and may be based on a number of factors, including some of these. Um, the source's physical condition. For items that are rare, unique, or fragile, um, you need to determine if it's safe to digitize them without damaging the originals. Some collection items may need minimal conservation treatment or stabilization by trained conservators before they can safely be transported, handled, and digitized. Items in poor condition due to damage or fragility are candidates for digital reformatting. The selection of material will almost always be content driven. Digitization can offer significant added value both in terms of access and functionality. Uniqueness, how rare is the item? Demand. Original items that are in high demand are strong candidates for digital reformatting. Accessibility. As we talked about, to improve access and outreach is one of the most important goals for any institution. How about the cultural significance or the audience and the mission of your institution? This is a sample collections matrix that you can use to rate various collections. If I were you, it, I think it's important. You can use this to prioritize them based on all of these different variables like we just discussed. You can create one like this to help you rank the materials that are the most important in your collections. Um, this particular matrix has specific things, diaries, oral histories, newspapers, publications, etc. But you can print this out and take this and um, you know, use it as you will. Um, I think it's a helpful tool. There are also some materials that you may choose not to digitize for a variety of reasons. Some items require more involved and extensive repair or expensive repair and are also fragile so they cannot be easily stabilized. For these items, preservation specialists must discuss treatment options with the curator or the project manager of the collection. Here is a slide that you can refer to later of materials that you may want to exclude from digitizing. This was taken from the Library of Congress website. I think it's a really good list. Um, I'll touch on a few of them here, such as uh, things such as paper that is acidic, fragile, has missing pieces, um, perhaps paper with iron gall ink that's eaten into the page, items with loose or flaking media, photographs that are curled or creased or wrinkled, um, deteriorated cellulose nitrate on acetate film and scrolls or non-traditional uh, textual or image formats. Again, this is a list that you can refer to later, but I think it's important to have in your, in your repertoire. So as I mentioned, I want to touch on copyright, but just briefly, um, this is extremely important. Just because it's in your collection doesn't mean that you are allowed to do whatever you want with it. How do you know if you have the right to reformat or distribute it? Before you digitize, please make an effort to track down the copyright. These are some things to consider. Does your institution own the copyright or have permission to distribute? Again, just because you own it doesn't mean you have the copyright. If you don't know, you will need to find out. Does the donor hold the rights? If so, contact them. Do you have a clear documentation of gifts? This is a good time to review or revisit your deed of gift. If you need to, modify the agreement to include rights or permissions to publish. Here's a great comprehensive list of copyright resources that you can refer to later. Next, I'll talk about quality control. We are going to touch on best practices, tools, formats, and metadata in this section. Institutions need to adhere to current industry standards and best practices as it relates to selection, acquisition, upkeep, 
and distribution of your digital assets and content. It, this also includes the accompanying metadata. The content needs to remain meaningful and readable. So I'm going to read some principles from Howard Besser, who is a scholar of digital preservation uh, from UCLA and NYU, and he's been working on scanning projects for nearly 20 years. Let's see. So let's take a look at some of his principles. Um, in the next couple of slides, we will do that. I'll go over some of the following principles in more detail in a little while as the presentation goes on. Uh, but let's start with that. Scan or capture at the highest resolution appropriate to the informational content of the originals. But remember, higher resolution means a larger file, so more storage. Resolution will change depending on the type of material it is. Scan at an appropriate level of quality to avoid rescanning and rehandling the originals in the future. So scan once. It's a really good idea to practice on non-fragile items. Create and store a master image file that can be used to produce derivative image files and serve a variety of current and future user needs. You will need high quality derivatives. And again, we'll discuss this in more detail in a bit. Use system components that are non-proprietary. Non-proprietary components are much easier to migrate and revise in the future. Use image file formats and compression techniques that conform to industry standards. Create backup copies of all files on a stable medium. The more you can, the better. Store backups in a climate-controlled area, one off-site if possible. Again, we're going to go over much more in detail uh, toward the end of this webinar on this particular section on making backups. Use high-quality hard drives or a server. Make sure you do backups and have refreshing strategies in place. Create meaningful metadata for image files or collections. Store all media in an appropriate environment. Monitor and recopy data as necessary. And perform quality control on your backups. Without this, they could be worthless. Outline a migration strategy for transferring data across generations of technology. And this can also be defined in your digital preservation policy if you have one. Anticipate and plan for future technological developments. Migration, preservation strategy, um, it's, it's difficult, so it's important to plan for the future. I included this, um, even though it is it says it's for digitizing rare books and manuscripts. Um, it's actually a great resource and has a great introduction on designing a digitization project just in general. It asks a series of basic questions to help define goals and resources you need, much like what we've already talked about, um, such as what is the vision of the project, who should be involved, what you want to digitize and why, how you'll incorporate quality management for the project. I just think it's a really good read, so um, the link is below there. There are some really good tools and resources out there um, so that you can keep um, with the best standards and practices for digitization. And these um, have been compiled, and I think it's a really, um, it's a really useful tool as well. Um, the following list will address all kinds of issues, technical overviews, capture specs, hardware, software, metadata, um, copyright. Uh, workflow, file naming, storage, and a number of other considerations for digitization. So I think it's a, uh, good to have on hand, as well as this one, um, standards organizations. This was taken from the Library of Congress, but it's a nice little compilation and a good idea to refer to these in the future as well. So at this point, we've looked at some big picture issues before making the commitment to digitize your collections, but now we want to focus on some of the more technical aspects of digitization. So we'll start with the basics of the actual digitization. Digitization technologies allow users to control the bit depth, resolution, size, color, and other qualities that will affect how the image appears on a computer screen or is output to a printer. So we're going to talk about these three elements, pixels, bit depth, and resolution in greater detail. 
When you scan a photo or a document, the scanning device creates a digital image consisting of tens of thousands and sometimes millions of different colored tiny dots called pixels or picture elements. These small dots make up the images you see on the computer. Normally, you cannot see the individual pixels because they're so small, which is good because most people want to look at a smooth image rather than a pixelated one. Um, the dimensions of a digital image are expressed, though, in terms of these pixels. They're the smallest physical element of a digital display device that the eye can discern. So if you were to zoom in close to any photo on your computer screen, uh, you'll see them, rows and rows of tiny little squares. And the dimensions, you may have seen this listed out 800 by 600 or 1520 by 1280. These are the pixels, so 800 pixels by 600 pixels, etc. Digitizing is not limited to text or images. You can also digitize video and audio, but in this webinar we will just be discussing documents and photos. Bit depth is a measurement of the number of bits of data or number of colors per pixel. The more bits per pixel or bit depth, the more information the pixel contains and this means better quality. So black and white image is called bit tonal, which is one bit per pixel. It only, claim, uh, it only contains two colors, black and white. It's a monochromatic image. The most common setting for a grayscale image is 8 bits per pixel, which actually yields about 256 shades of gray. And the most common setting for color is 24 bits per pixel, which yields about 16.7 million color tones. Some scanners will actually do 16-bit grayscale and 48-bit um, color. With more bits per pixel, you have more to work with when, you'll, when you will be editing your photo. This also increases data and the file size. Here's an example of the differences between the various bit depths. You can clearly see that the higher the bit depth, the better the quality. The next element we want to talk about is resolution. Resolution is determined by the number of pixels used to present an image. It is expressed in dots per inch, or DPI, which usually refers to the number of dots of ink in a printed inch, or pixels per inch, PPI, which usually refers to the pixel density of on-screen images. In either case, it is a measurement of pixel density. Commercial scanners generally use the term DPI. The more pixels or dots you have in a one inch square space, the more detail an image can hold. So increasing the number of pixels used to capture an image will result in a higher resolution and capture a finer detail. More DPI is not always better, though, as you can only scan so much detail at one time. Beyond that limited amount of detail, more DPI cannot actually add anything of value. So there are optimum settings for different photo sizes and types. For most personal work, such as snapshot prints and common enlargements, like 4x6, 5x7s, 8x10s, um, 300 to 400 DPI. For small prints or slides, you'd need around 1400 to 1500 DPI. Since they are so small and hold a lot of detail in this small area, you will need to capture more dots per inch in order to obtain more detail. If you want a close-up, such as an enlargement of a face in a crowd, increase the DPI in order to get the size you want. Keep in mind, though, that the quality may not be as good once you've changed the DPI. Negatives should be around 1,500 to 2,000 DPI, again, since they hold a lot of detail. Increasing the DPI will always increase the file size because you are adding more data to the file. When choosing resolution and bit depth, remember your overall project mission and audience. This will help you select the proper specifications.
These are excellent resources for more specific technical details. The first is from the ALA, which has a great minimum capture guidelines section, and it breaks down every type of source content, and I mean every type of source content. So um, this is just documents and photos, but there you will see everything. The Cornell link is also a great overall tool and tutorial, anything from basic terminology to project management. So I highly recommend checking these out. Once captured, a digital image can be saved in numerous file formats that may or may not include compression technologies that reduce the size of the file. Scanner software saves your scans as a digital file in a format that you choose. The ones that we're going to focus on today are the most common file formats for digital photos, and those are TIFF and JPEG. And then we're also going to discuss PDF files. Of course, there's also GIFs and PDFAs and audio and video files and a plethora of other formats, but for our use here for this webinar, we're going to discuss TIFFs and JPEGs and touch briefly on PDFs. Before we head into talking about the different formats, <coughs> excuse me, I just want to define a couple of terms. Part of the reason for these plethora, for the plethora of file types, is the need for compression. Image files can be quite large, and larger file types mean more disk usage and slower downloads. Compression is a term used to describe ways of cutting the size of, of the file, allowing them to download faster and take up less space. Compression, compression schemes can either be lossless or lossy. With lossless compression, the image preserves all of the file's original data, discarding no information. It looks for more efficient ways to represent an image while making no compromises in accuracy. This is common in TIFF images, which makes them much larger. With lossy compression, most of the data is discarded. There is some degradation in the image and data loss in order to achieve a smaller file size. Files can be reduced up to a thousand times. Because of this, some degree of quality is also lost. This is very common in JPEG images. Here's an example of lossless versus lossy compression. The main difference between TIFFs and JPEGs has to do with compression, which as I just mentioned is basically squeezing down the digital data in order to make a smaller file. TIFFs are uncompressed. There are options when you're creating TIFFs, um, <clears throat> excuse me, such as no compression or uncompressed, and there's also what's called the LZW lossless compression routine, which just means that it will cut the size of the file in half without losing any digital data. But even though it does cut it in half, the files are still quite large. Um, but if you have a large collection or a large archive, even a 50% reduction will reduce storage requirements and costs over time. JPEGs, on the other hand, are compressed, as we talked about. Saving images as JPEGs employs a lossy compression. A JPEG file loses some of the digital data captured by the scanner. But the good news is you can choose JPEG quality levels from maximum to lowest quality, like this. This is an example of a JPEG saved at maximum quality versus one saved at the lowest quality. So let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using TIFFs versus JPEGs. Let's start with TIFFs, which stands for Tagged Image File Format. The advantages, they are very popular among users and have gained recognition in graphic design. They're the format of choice for long-term archiving. They do not compress to make small files since they are meant to preserve quality. So they're lossless, as I mentioned. This also makes it the best option for printing and editing. They're very easy to use with software that deals with page layout, publishing, and photo manipulation. And they can be saved with layers, which is good for editing purposes or if you need to re-edit the file later. It's a high quality image format and it's supported by many imaging programs. It can be used for files up to a bit depth of 64 and can be tagged with basic metadata. The disadvantages, it's a very large file size, so you cannot use them online. They have a very long transfer time. 
They take up a large amount of disk space and there is a slow loading time. JPEG is short for Joint Photographic Experts Group and is the most popular among the image formats used on the web. It is most used and the most widely accepted format. It's the standard for web display since the file is smaller. It takes up much less room and requires less time to transfer to sites, so loading time is faster and it can achieve considerable size reductions. It can be used for files up to 24-bit and support a full spectrum of up to 16 million colors. The disadvantages though, very low quality. They lose quality with their high degree of compression, so they're lossy. So um, much of the information will be lost from the original when you save it this way. This becomes even more evident if they're edited and then resized, so they're usually not a good choice for editing or printing. And they're not good for archiving images. JPEG should never be seen as a format of choice for digital masters, but as a, as a good choice for web delivery. Due to the reduction of quality, they should not be used for long-term preservation. There's also, I um, wanted to mention, the JPEG 2000. It's a bit contested in the cultural heritage community. Some want to use these for master files as they take up less space and they can reduce storage costs, but they're a little bit better than traditional JPEGs. Um, but TIFF is still the recommended format, so for now. Here is an example of JPEG compression on varying levels. As you keep compressing the image, you see as you go from left to right, you lose more and more data. You've probably all used or received PDFs at some point. PDF, the portable document format, was developed by Adobe. A PDF captures the printed intent of a document. The advantage against other formats is that you can be sure that anyone will view the file exactly as you want on another computer system. The free Adobe Reader is widely available for almost all computer systems. PDF files are very small and the content can be stored compressed. However, even though it's compressed, it's still a great way to view and print images at high resolution. So, an example would be if you wanted to send some high resolution images off to a printer, you can make PDF files of the TIFFs you created so that they get the best quality. And you can email this because they're so small. You would not be able to email a batch of TIFFs. You probably can't even email one TIFF. They're quite large, or they can be very, very large. But keep in mind, TIFFs, I'm sorry, PDFs are not in lieu of TIFFs. Again, they're created from the TIFF image files, but they're simply still document files, so they cannot be edited the way TIFFs can, and they are definitely not um, what you should be keeping for your masters. TIFFs should still definitely be what you hold on to for your master file. PDFs um, also a great solution if you want to upload and distribute a document to the internet, again, because they're compressed. There are also PDFAs, which some institutions have been using more and more, with the thought that they are better for long-term archiving. Again, another thing up, still up for debate. Um, PDFAs um, use embedded fonts versus a regular PDF, which just links to fonts. So they will be larger than traditional PDFs because you're actually embedding these fonts within there. But it is supposed to guarantee uh, more reliable reproduction over time, regardless of the application or the system that was used to create it, since the file fonts are embedded. So anywhere that file is opened on any computer will be exactly as you see it. Um, the content, of course, would stay the same in a traditional PDF, but your fonts would perhaps change depending on the computer you were looking at in a traditional PDF. A good rule of thumb is to scan your document or photo as a TIFF and then keep this as your master file, as I've mentioned. You can make copies of it for editing as well as making JPEGs and PDFs of each file for easy storage and usability, but never edit your master TIFF file.
One of the most important parts of digitization is the information that gets recorded in each file in a way that makes them easy to identify later on. So let's talk about metadata. This is not a simple conversation as there are a lot of different metadata schemas and I'm certainly not the expert on metadata but I will give you some of the basics. At its most basic level, metadata is something that helps to better describe the data that you're trying to remember. So it's data about data. It's information that tells you something about the digital image that you've saved. It's a way of tagging the internal digital information of the file and used to describe things such as its type, size, purpose, date or time, people, places, etc. Metadata can be attached to any file so that searching by a keyword or tag helps locate the digital, the digital record later on. There are three main types of metadata, descriptive, structural, and administrative, with two subsets of administrative rights management and preservation metadata. I included this resource um, from the Collaborative Digitization Program. Um, it provides guidelines for creating metadata records for digitized cultural heritage resources, and it's really well written, so highly recommended. Metadata is not a simple subject, and I think this breaks it down quite nicely. So let's talk about the different types. First we have descriptive metadata. It describes an object and includes items such as keyword, author, title, dimensions, media, etc. This information is helpful for creating finding aids. Important decisions you'll need to make. Um, what information do your users need? And what categories or browse functions should you be considering? What will help your audience when they're searching, in other words? Structural metadata pinpoints the relationships between objects. So for example, you could say insert number one was attached to journal number five. It's basically what ties everything together. It's the internal structure, um, such as the order of pages in a chapter or individual diary entries in a diary section of a book. It may also include page numbering or table of contents. It's structural metadata. Administrative um, information for managing resources such as the file type, when and how it was created, and the technical information such as the hardware and software that was used to create it. This is sometimes referred to as technical metadata. It really depends on what you're reading about metadata. Sometimes they refer to it as administrative, sometimes technical. Two important subsets of administrative metadata are rights management, which, is, um, which deals specifically with intellectual property rights and copyright, and preservation metadata, information about archiving and managing preservation activities. So it will track preservation activities throughout the life cycle of a digital object and record, excuse me, record actions taken to preserve content, both the analog and digital forms of those objects. It's important to develop a style guide, um, making the metadata consistent and having quality control throughout the process. Determining the workflow, who will enter the metadata, how will it be entered, and who's going to approve it. The most common fields, I mean you can see them here, I'll just read them real quick. Uh, the author or creator, the copyright, credit, caption, description, um, what types of keywords do you want to enter, do you want to put in a title or an object name? Location-related fields, you can put in things such as city, state, country, country code, continent, um, the date created, the date updated, the original file name, and it really goes on and on. You can add a number of things to metadata. It just really goes on and on. These are just some of the most common ones. Next, we're going to go over hardware, software, and preparation for scanning or digitizing. The equipment used and the performance has an important impact on the quality of the image you create. You should choose equipment that will be suitable for the materials that you are digitizing. What scanner is right for your project depends on the format, the size, and condition of your materials. For materials for which you want to study minute details of an object, high-resolution digital cameras are often recommended. 
for documents and photograph collections, flatbed scanners are well suited. Um, special book scanners and cradles can also be used for a wide range of printed and bound books. Special, um, I'm sorry, consider using a scanning system that provides the best digital images possible within the limitations of your resources. Here um, are some different types of scanners that organizations or individuals may want to use. Flatbed scanners, I'll just kind of go through somewhat briefly just to sort of explain a little bit about each. Uh, flatbeds are suitable for papers, flat photographs, and printed materials. Uh, you should note the size of the scan area and make sure your materials will fit on the scanning bed. Um, a lot of consumer models have a scanning area of 8.5 by 11, but uh, there are many models that have a bigger scanning area than that. Um, slide scanners, slide and film scanners um, digitize transparent materials. Uh, some flatbed scanners also have the capability to scan slides and film, so you may not need a specific slide scanner or film scanner. Open book scanners. They're designed to digitize books without damage to the original, which is frequently caused from flattening the book on a flatbed. But these can be quite expensive, if you've done any research on them. Uh, drum scanners, also very expensive. Mostly used, though, by press and graphics communities working with contemporary materials. Since the materials are usually affixed to a drum that rotates at a high speed around a sensor. So these are definitely not recommended for cultural heritage materials or anything fragile. Wide format scanners, um, they're designed to digitize large format materials, architectural blueprints, for example, or maps. Um, materials are again drawn over a scanning sensor using drums. So again, there is danger of damage or rips. So again, not recommended for cultural heritage materials. Basically, don't put anything through that that you're not prepared to lose. Digital cameras, large format materials such as posters, 3D objects, some maps, um, and artwork may require a digital camera. Most digital cameras do not have the capacity to create sufficient resolution for preservation capture of materials, but professional level cameras definitely produce very high quality images. The right choice for you depends on your project, your goals, your materials, and your budget. Um, try to think ahead and be flexible. In general, the flat bed with a large scanning bed is relatively inexpensive and flexible for a variety of materials. But if you're only scanning books, then of course you'd need to rethink your choice. These are just some pictures of some scanners, various Epson scanners. And let's see, here are a couple of large format book scanners. Again, these are on the high end. So let's talk about software. There's scanner software. This is the software that controls the scanner and passes information to computer storage or image editing software. Most scanners come with this software built in. Higher end scanners come with software that allows the operator to manually adjust the scanner settings. Scanner software must be able to output image files in the appropriate file format, as we discussed earlier, TIFFs, JPEGs, etc. There's also image editing software. This allows you to manipulate images, create derivative image files. Photoshop is actually the standard. Um, but it can require staff training and future upgrades. But you need to make sure that your computer has the minimum requirements to have this software. Some scanning software also does allow a certain amount of image manipulation already built in. So that's something you can research. Digital asset management software. Digital projects can result in a large number of files that need to be managed. There is software available that will provide a sort of out-of-the-box solution for the creation of workflow management, um, but you will need some kind of digital asset management on site, and we're going to talk about this next. Uh-oh. Has anyone else lost audio? I'm just going to pause for a moment. Uh, okay, it looks like a lot of people have audio. 
So Susan has lost audio. I assume she still has, but it looks like it might be okay on our end. So I'm sorry, Susan. Um, you can wait a minute, see if you get back up. Oh, more people are... Audio has gone out. Everyone seems to... Let me type. Oh, you type. Okay. Okay, um, so we're going to move on, so everyone mostly can hear. So think of your digital asset management system as your hub where your assets live, where you can move them around and work with them. It creates a centralized area for you to access your assets. They're basically centralized repositories of media files that are stored in a database. And it's, like, it's basically like one container that manages everything about your object. Digital asset management refers to how you take in, handle, and distribute everything you have in digital form, from digital images to word processing documents. It can also refer to the protocols and tasks around ingest, storage, archiving, and distribution of assets. They also provide an infrastructure for preserving and managing your digital assets with search capabilities to help users identify and retrieve the ones that are the most relevant to them. Here are a few examples. Luna Insight, Content DM, Islandora. These are just a few that are out there and I'm assuming that a few of you or most of you have at least heard of a couple of them but maybe not. There are so many out there. Content DM seems to be um, in, in a lot of institutions that I've been to. There's also what's called a CMS or a content management system. A CMS enables the management of different types of web content. It's a computer application used to create, edit, manage, and publish content in a consistently organized fashion. It basically helps users with no technical knowledge how to easily create, edit, and manage content that is delivered onto the web. It manages information about the object and its associated metadata. CMS systems attach images for the web, but they do not necessarily manage or keep track of your assets like a digital asset manager does. You may even have both at your institution. The CMS will pull data from and information from your digital asset manager in order to put things onto your website. While the lines between a digital asset manager and a content management system are somewhat blurred. The DAM systems are focused on managing large collections of large, high-resolution digital images and videos, while a CMS is focused on mainstream web content. It's basically the back end of your website and allows someone to be able to go in and do updates. I included a few slides on basics of digitization preparation. Um, for scanning documents or photos, and some of this may sound almost too basic, um, so I apologize in advance, but you'd really be surprised um, as to what people will do. So it's just to put it all out there. Um, it's important to prepare your documents for scanning. Assess the condition of the materials to ensure that the documents are not too fragile for scanning. As well as general fragility, you should look for mold, pages stuck together, inserts obscuring records or any damage which has affected the legibility of the text. Remember that list I showed you earlier, materials you may wish to avoid digitizing. Uh, you should remove any staples, pins, or paper clips. Use both hands at all times when moving boxes and documents. Ensure scanning beds are large enough to support the whole document. Never leave documents exposed on the scanner when unattended. Support books and other bound documents with a book cradle or book wedges if needed. Turn pages from the fore edge the, or the right edge of the document, not from the tail or the bottom. It's not acceptable to use moisture 
for page turning, and that includes like licking your fingers to turn a page. Do not pinch document corners together to turn the page. The scanning operator should unfold folded corners, but not refold them back onto themselves after they've done the scan. Where documents are attached to each other and cannot be separated, try to scan the document in a way which, present, which prevents the introduction of new creases, or try. Take care with applied and pendant seals as they are extremely fragile. They, they should not be knocked or have weight or pressure applied to them. And they should not be left to hang off the edge of a workstation. And do not use glass on them without adjustments approved by a conservator. Keep your documents in order. The contents of boxes should stay together and stay in the same sequence in which they came from the box. Work on only one document at a time so that boxes and documents do not get mixed up. Replace documents in closed boxes at the end of the day and return them to storage or wherever else you're keeping them. Annotation or labeling of any part of the document should be avoided. Do not use sticky notes or post-it notes to mark the documents, nothing with adhesive on it. You can use paper strips or paper markers. Just remember to remove the slips of paper from the document after you scan. Scanning work workstations should provide adequate surface area to ensure the full support of documents and allow for an organized workspace. Too little space can have a negative impact on document handling. Keep the area clean and tidy. Keep bags and coats in lockers or wherever else you can put them. Do not take them into the scanning area. Keep workspaces free of food or drink, which also includes chewing gum. You should use pencils only. No ink or felt tip pens or markers or colored pencils or crayons, etc. You should not use hand or face moisturizers or moisturizing wipes, lip balms, or anything similar that is applied by hand. Your hands should be clean and dry at all times when handling the documents. Do not wear cotton gloves or powdered gloves. You can wear unpowdered nitrile or latex or similar to latex gloves if instructed specifically by a conservator or for example if you're handling some particular photographic material that you that you must wear gloves. Do not use handling aids such as rubber thimbles or other tools unless approved by a conservator. Do not use cleaning liquids unless approved by a conservator. If any damage to documents is found during scanning, you should bring this to the attention of the conservator or the project manager um, handling it for some kind of repair before any scanning were to take place. When determining any digitization plan, you should decide if you are going to digitize in-house or outsource. You can ask yourself, will this be a one-time project? Or is your institution interested in committing to ongoing digitization efforts? Will you need special equipment? There are pros and cons to both. So let's take a look. Establishing an in-house facility requires an institution to support the full digitization chain with appropriate staff, space and facilities, equipment and supplies, and to absorb time and expenses associated with ramping up. Here are some advantages of an in-house approach though. Uh, learn by doing, or you learn as you go. This will allow your staff and your organization to develop experience. You'll retain direct control over the entire range of imaging functions and the entire process. You uh, provide for security and proper handling and accessibility to materials using an in-house approach. You can prioritize your library or archives requirements and you maintain consistent and high quality assurance requirements. Some disadvantages, however, it's a large investment in equipment and staff. There is usually no set per image cost. The institution pays for expenses instead of products including costs of downtime, training, and technological obsolescence. There may be limited production capabilities and facilities there's a range of staffing expertise required, and knowledge of best practices can be daunting. 
So if you were to outsource some advantages, there's cost containment and limited risk. Institution pays for deliverables. And there's usually a set price per image, which helps facilitate project planning and budgeting. Costs are typically lower than in-house figures. You pay only for production, not for equipment or staffing. Vendors can often handle large volumes of materials that you may not be able to in-house. Vendor pays all expenses, expertise, training, technologi technology obsolescence costs. These would be absorbed by the vendor. Broad range of options and services may be available by outsourcing, including imaging, metadata creation, enhancements, processing, um, encoding, derivative creation, printing, storing, backup, uh, database development, and on and on. The disadvantages of outsourcing. The institution is one step removed from the process, so you'd have less control over the process or quality. Services most often performed off-site or perhaps even offshore. The vendor may lack experience with the needs of cultural institutions, if that's important to you. Lack of standards and best practices which, with which to define requirements or negotiate for services. There could be challenges in communication from RFP development to contracting to production and quality requirements. There could be security, handling, or transportation issues. But ultimately, both are viable options. Making, make the choice early. Um, and the decision, this decision will affect virtually everything, including planning and budgeting. This is especially true if you're writing a grant. So it's important to discuss this with your institution as early as possible. Long-term management. It is imperative that you make sure the files can be easily identified, organized, accessed, and maintained over time. We'll talk a bit about storage, file naming protocols, and maintenance and backups in this next section. Records, whether they're personal, professional, academic, are a fundamental part of our life. And keeping track of them and maintaining all these important documents is definitely not a simple task. Who hasn't been searching for a file and cannot find it no matter what you do? It is very important that you establish some kind of file management system to keep proper records. Otherwise, you could end up looking something like this. We've all seen this. This is no fun. So, the importance. Consider how important it is to keep, store, maintain, find, and retrieve records when you need them. Information and records have always been a prime resource of any institution. We can't function without it. Businesses operate based on these records. Some files may need to be edited and then thereby creating multiple versions which may end up being distributed to different people, employees, or even third parties, or customers, or vendors. So all of these versions need to be tracked so that a specific version can be found when it's needed. It is very important to track your derivatives. These days, businesses are creating and receiving records at such an escalating rate, not only in huge volume, but the records are coming in a variety of formats. Um, digital images, either ones that are received from outside or a scanned image. We've got emails, word processing documents. And then these documents may also exist in multiple storage media, for example, backup drives or CDs or DVDs, flash drives. They could be on local or network hard drives or on the cloud. With all these options, proper organization of archives or personal records is crucial for good file management. Many institutions, due to a lack of policies and procedures on file management, can face some problems and risks. So they may keep some records for too long, waste time looking for other information, or fail to abide by record keeping rules or regulations, and potentially fail to safeguard vital information. With almost all new information now being created in digital form or getting digitized, it is becoming increasingly important to manage and organize these files. We all need a system where you can locate files quickly and easily. 
so that you can access them from anywhere when needed, as well as being able to access them on the computer and on the cloud or wherever else they are stored. You can restrict access to authorized users only, so there is an added security there. Digital files can be saved in secured environments using a server or encryption, perhaps. You can store the documents for short and long-term use, and you can keep a safe copy to avoid disaster. With digitizing large collections, since, the only, since only the digital version is being used on a regular basis, the original analog version or document can be safely stored away and protected from day-to-day -day access and common disasters. Next, I want to talk about how to organize your digital files, whether for personal or business use. The task of organizing digital files can be intimidating with the thought of combining hundreds or even thousands of files, but once you have a system established, you will be able to drag and drop files and complete the project fairly quickly. There are two types of files on your computer, the ones you make and the ones you collect. You choose what these files are called and where they are stored. The main thing to remember when organizing and naming files is be descriptive, but keep it simple. The goal is to come up with a structure that's easy for you to remember and follow. Don't make it too long and complicated. So be consistent. Um, once you develop a technique as to how you want to label things, use this technique all the time. And file management software can simply refer to images on your server or creating an image database for organizing your files or a digital asset manager like we talked about earlier and we will talk a little bit more about this in the next slide so naming the digital file itself once your photos and documents are grouped in folders or subfolders however you've decided you should standardize the names of the photos and documents themselves it's really useful for sorting later Use standard file extensions so anyone can open the file. Names should be short and simple, and they should cover the basics, capturing some of the who, what, when, where, and why. Make sure you add enough information so that it's organized and easy to understand. Other tips, it's a great idea to start with the year or the date, then include some type of descriptive text, such as the company or the job name or the job number, etc. Um, you should avoid using spaces or special characters because some software will not be able to read those. And a good idea is to use an underscore to separate ideas because that is a special character that everyone, almost every system can recognize. So here's an example I just wrote down. Um, there are many other ways you can name your files. This was just one type of example. Uh, many photo or digital camera programs actually let you automatically name a saved file as you create them, but you can also go back later and rename files for more detail and accuracy. Um, you may have many files on your server that were created a long time ago, and they just maybe have a number, um, but once you go through and rename them, you will be happy that you did so. Keep in mind that your photos or documents may one day become separated from the folder you're putting them in. So this, again, is why it's such a good idea to include enough information in the file name to identify the file without the folder. Here are a couple of excellent resources for more information on best practices for file naming. You can refer to later. The last but maybe the most important aspect of file managing is backing up your files. Without a proper backup, you can lose everything. A single computer failure can wipe out your entire collection if not properly backed up. One mistake in editing your file can cause it to overwrite the original, causing the original impossible to recover. A disaster such as a flood or a fire could wipe out the collection if it is not properly archived and in a safe space. The main thing to remember is the 3-2-1 rule. To lower your risk of data loss, it's imperative that you have three copies of your important data, ideally in three locations. So, for example, so at least three copies. These should be kept in different places on at least two different formats with at least one copy off-site. This is all based on redundancy. 
Remember, the second and third copies should be kept in different locations. So you can keep one on hand in case you need quick recovery, and the other should be kept off-site where it is not subject to the same threats. You have a lot of options when it comes to making backup copies of your files. Um, some examples, you could keep the original on your computer hard drive or server and the second and third backups could be stored on different external hard drives. You can even have a fourth backup with an online storage company or use the cloud as one of your backups. This is becoming more and more common for backing up and archiving files, but remember um, the, the cloud needs to have a backup as well. The more regularly you can back up, the better. Weekly is best. And just FYI, CDs and USB drives, which I know a lot of people still have, are not good for long-term storage since the media is too prone to failure or deterioration. Digital files are becoming just as precious and fragile as our original mementos, so preserving them is critical. Digitization is the final step in processing our collections. It provides a used copy so that originals can be stored and used infrequently, limiting handling of the original, which may be brittle or even damaged. This technology provides the benefit of enhancing retrieval and access. Once you've determined how you can implement a digitization project at your institution, uh, create an informed workflow. Find out what best meets the mission of your organization. Focus on goals and objectives. Consider your users and audience. Prioritize your collections. Implement best, pra implement best practices and industry standards. Properly manage your assets. And of course, back everything up. Back up, back up, back up. So, that is, the, that is the webinar. That is everything. Um, does anyone have any questions? We looks like we have another 15 minutes or so, so feel free to ask questions. I'll try to help you as best I can. If anyone has any questions. And thank you. Also, if anyone has any, you know, maybe more involved questions, you can always email me at the address here on the screen. <laughs> if a DAM system is cost prohibitive, what would be the next best solution? Well, even just having a simple database at your institution, I mean, you don't need to have anything super complicated. Um, so yeah, if that's out of your budget, then I would say just having some kind of database that you can use um, to manage your records. I know that doesn't give you any specifics exactly, but really there are so many databases out there that are in it, are not DAM systems, so um, I'm sure you can find something that works in your budget. Can you direct me to a resource that will help me to convert high resolution photos? Um, I will, you know what, if you want to email me, I can talk to you more directly about that, Karen, if that's okay. Okay, great. But please, yeah, please definitely send me an email. I can give you some ideas. Karen, one quick question, sorry. I do want to ask you though, do you have any kind of image, imaging software like Photoshop? Because if you do, 
Yeah, you should be able to um, actually, uh, you should be able to just open those up. If you can open them up, you can save them as a PDF. At least the new versions of Photoshop, you definitely can do that. Um, maybe someone else has an idea. We can, I can look into that after this. But just as a quick answer, you should be able to open up your Photoshop file and save them as a PDF. Unless it's so old, but um, for as far back as I can remember, you can do that. Unless someone else is um, disputing that for the old. Yes, an old version, yeah. Um, let's see, Christina, um, research for tips or things to look for when selecting cameras. Um, you can also send me an email and I can talk to our digital um, imaging manager our, of the studio here at CCHA and he most likely has a resource that I can um, send you. So Christina, please send me an email about that. Great, thank you. Um, This was for flat digitization, but do the same principles apply to 3D? You know, I honestly can't speak to 3D collections wholeheartedly. Uh, we don't do any 3D um, imaging here. Um, but I, so as far as the actual taking the image with a 3D camera or, or other such type equipment, that I can't speak to. But as far as the output, yes, I think that the output and many of the same principles will still apply what types of files and organization and backups and all that other stuff. Um, definitely deciding what to digitize, all those other things are definitely going to apply. As, as far as the actual digitizing of 3D, that I can't speak to. But everything else is basically the same, yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, we don't have specific slide scanners here. We have flatbeds that also incorporate slide scanners inside them. Um, so I really don't know exactly how expensive they are. I mean, they can get quite pricey depending on your budget. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I think that I mean, with flatbeds, they can range from a few hundred um, to, you know, many, many, many thousands. So I think the same could probably be said for slide scanners. Because I know you can get some, <clears throat> lower lower quality slide scanners that are probably um, not as expensive as, you know, professional grade. Of course, you probably want professional, but it really depends on what you're scanning. And sometimes just being able to scan something rather than not being able to scan something is, you know, better. So, sorry, I don't have specifics on the cost for those, but... Looks like Grant has another question. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Okay. 
uh, Diani is responding to you, Grant. Sorry, it says Asia Davis. <laughs> We're having some technical difficulties. Thanks, Gloria. Again, if anyone has any questions they think of later, um, you can always email me at the ttolansky at ccaha.org here that's listed. And there will be a recording of the webinar available after this, so you can um, refer to all of those resources we talked about earlier. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Christina and Karen. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Well, thank you to everyone. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I'll wait another minute. Okay. Well, I hope this was helpful for everyone. I really appreciate you attending and registering and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.